Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to Excel London. After 15 semi-finals, we now have the live final of Tories Have Got Talent. But the question is, will we need a super over? Yes. Who knows? Now, my name's Ian Dale. I present the LBC radio evening show, 7 to 10 every evening, and we are transmitting this on LBC throughout the country right now. Welcome also to the viewers of Sky News and the BBC News Channel. Now, let me tell you how tonight is going to work. I'm going to introduce you to our two warm-up acts in a minute. Kylie Minogue was unavailable, so you'll have to make do with Andrew Sharp and Brandon Lewis. Then we will meet the two candidates. Firstly, Boris Johnson. He won the toss and he's elected to go first. And slight change to our usual format for the hustings. Boris Johnson will be introduced by one of his chief supporters, Liz Truss, the chief secretary to the Treasury. She, of course, was the first cabinet minister to declare for Boris. Boris will then speak for 12 minutes, and I'll then interview him for 10, and then it's over to you. And then it'll be exactly the same for Jeremy Hunt, who will be introduced by Eleanor Bunbury, who is, who is on the candidates list and a political blogger. Now, then we're going to open it up to you for questions. We're not going to have any pre-selected questions tonight. They'll all be spontaneous. Um, my only advice is to try to be original, because the candidates have gone through 15 of these hustings. So if you ask a generic question, the chances are they will have answered it before. So try and think how you can scrutinize them to the best effect, because they're not just running for leader of the Conservative Party, they are running to be Prime Minister as well. So it really is going to be crucial that you ask them the right questions. So I hope you enjoy the evening. It's been an absolute pleasure for me to host so many of these hustings so far. I think it's shown the Conservative Party at its best with the quality of questions that have come from the audience. So you've got a lot to live up to tonight, ladies and gentlemen. So without further ado, let me introduce you to the chairman of the Conservative Party's National Convention, Andrew Sharp. Indeed, Ian, um, and thank you all. It's a pleasure and a privilege to welcome you to this, the final hustings of this particular leadership contest. And it's great to see so many people here. There's been tremendous demand to attend hustings around the country, as I'm sure you're aware, and that's necessitated more than one change of venue, including tonight. And obviously, this is a very special venue for a number of reasons. Firstly, because it's comfortably the largest that we've had, and you are comfortably the biggest audience. So pat yourselves on the back, London. But it's also very special because I can also confidently say this is the only venue, hustings-wise, where I've actually seen the Red Hot Chili Peppers play. <laughs> now, seriously, there is no doubt that this process, as Ian said, has actually been very good news for our party. You'll have seen plenty of positive media commentary about previous events. And some of the um, questions have even been described by no less an organ as the FT as spot on. Both candidates have expounded a positive vision of a post-Brexit Britain, which is tolerant, optimistic, global in outlook, pro-business and pro-free enterprise. The audiences have been thoughtful, engaged and sizable. And this exercise therefore helps to dispel some of the typical media narrative about us and our party. Although, ladies and gentlemen, you have to still beware fake news. The New York Times recently described all of you and us as a fanatical sect. Wouldn't it be nice if in this the centenary year of the Conservative Women's Organization, they actually could celebrate some of the progressive achievements of the Conservative Party, which are many and varied. Now, as you know, when you mention progressive and conservative in the same sentence, Twitter fires up quite quickly. But to all the trolls out there, check your facts. Here are just a few. Animal Sentience, 1824. The second MP of BME descent, elected just up the road in Bethnal Green, 1896. Clean Air, 1956, and Gay Marriage in 2013. And let's not forget that Mrs. Pankhurst herself was a Conservative. So we're here tonight not just to elect a party leader, but a Prime Minister. Many of you will have already voted, and if you haven't, you should probably get on with it. We will know the winner in a week's time, and we're going to need to help the winner and unite behind him. He needs to deliver Brexit, and he needs to get back to the serious business of beating Labour. 
We, need the, we made the case at the party board that the leadership campaign had to reach every part of our United Kingdom. All members, we argued, should have access to at least one hustings. There was no disagreement on this, so at this point I'd very much like to thank Brandon Lewis, the party chairman, for his support, and also more generally for his support for the voluntary party over the past year and a bit. I'd also like to thank at this point the ops and conferences, conference teams at CCHQ, led by Tom Skinner and David Comerford. Organising all of these has been a mammoth undertaking, and they've done an absolutely first-class job, as I'm sure you'd agree. I'd like to thank Ian Dale. Um, as, as he said, by the time this is finished, he's going to be well into his 20th hour of husting, which is a possible book title, I think. Um, but he has moderated all of them with considerable rigour, um, but also very fairly. And finally, I'd very much like to thank... <laughs> finally, I'd very much like to thank the regional team here in London, led by Gotts Mahindra. Um, Gotts is a tireless advocate for London, as I'm sure many of you know, um, and he's deservedly held in very high regard. Now, before I go, can I ask one further question, please, on the subject of, of resources? You will have seen on your chairs um, some campaign manager program materials. If you could please read that and uh, perhaps get involved, it would be very much appreciated. We are very reliant on others for our help with this program, but the simple fact is, where we have campaign managers, we do well, and where we don't, we don't. So if we could all engage, um, that would be really, really very much appreciated. That's it from me. Thank you very much indeed for listening. Please enjoy your event and make sure your questions are spot on. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Andrew. Just let me say one word about how the question and answer sessions are going to work. Obviously, given the size of this room, I won't be able to say the woman in the red at the back there. So it's going to be, uh, I hope you'll be able to recognize who I am pointing to and wave at me if you think it's you. I will start over that side, then come to this block and go forward and then backwards. So we'll see how that works, shall we? Now, let me introduce you to our final uh, warm-up speaker before we hear from the candidates. It's the chairman of the Conservative Party, Brandon Lewis. Good evening. And first of all, I just want to add to something Andrew said, which is I think we could once again give a huge thank you to Ian Dell for hosting so many of these. I haven't quite totted it up, but I suspect at the end of this, uh, whoever the winner is, Ian will be able to say he has uh, spent more time quizzing the next Prime Minister of our country than pretty much anybody else, and he's travelled the country to do it as well. So, Ian, from all of us, thank you. And thank you to all of you. Across the last few weeks, across our entire country, all four nations and all regions of the country, we have held hustings. And time and again, as Andrew rightly said, we as a party, I think, have shown why we are such a strong, such a good and such a positive party. Our members, all of us as members of the party, have taken our duty solemnly. And I've seen very clearly over the last few weeks that our family around the country have been very clear about the fact that we're not just selecting the next leader of our great party, but the next Prime Minister of our country. And the questions and the response has reflected that. And I know it will here tonight, where we have got, as you can see, one of the largest audiences we've had um, for some time, and certainly the largest of this hustings. So thank you, all of you, for coming to these hustings all over the last few weeks. And we also do need to remember that in all of those regions, there are seats that we do need to win to make sure that we hold great MPs. And a big thank you to my colleagues who are with us this evening. And also to gain more seats back from Labour and from Lib Dems to ensure that Jeremy Corbyn can never get the keys to Downing Street. And, <laughs> and we all recognise in Parliament we have a huge role to play in making sure we have got the policies to deliver that, but you have an opportunity to play your part every day. And as a party and as members and as volunteers, you do that week in and week out. And tonight, with those cards, that information about those campaign managers, every pound you give is potentially going towards another campaign manager that helps us win another seat. So please do look at that. And that does matter, because whoever wins this competition in just a few days' time, we want to make sure they are well-funded to go forward and defeat Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party. 
I think we have a national duty as a party to ensure that we are making it clear that we are the party, as we have seen at these hustings, that has the determination to deliver for the whole of the United Kingdom. And what you're here tonight, if you've been watching what you will have heard over the last few weeks from these great candidates, is that we are a party with leaders who have got vision, determination, passion and enthusiasm to take our country forward, reminding all of us and everyone in our country why we are the longest standing and most successful political party in the world and why we are clear that we have a duty to make sure we are returning Conservatives at both local and central government in the future. And tonight you will hear from both those candidates that positive vision. I hope you enjoy this evening. I hope you've got some great questions lined up. And if you haven't already, as Andrew again rightly said, make sure you remember to vote. Enjoy the evening. Right, the moment has come. It's time to meet the candidates. To introduce Boris Johnson, it's my pleasure to welcome the woman who tries to keep Philip Hammond under control. She's the MP for South West Norfolk, and she was the first in the Cabinet to endorse Boris Johnson. Please welcome Liz Truss. Well, good evening, everybody. It's fantastic to be here at XL tonight in London's Docklands. Docklands was once the beating heart of global trade, but it fell into decline and disrepair, only to be reimagined by a radical Tory who was prepared to shake things up. It took the vision of Margaret Thatcher to wrestle the powers of the rubbish Labour councils <laughs> and to establish and to establish the Docklands Development Corporation. These new freedoms liberated businesses to locate here and grow, and now Canary Wharf is one of the financial centres of the world. A few decades later, the same brand of vision and leadership was realised in this very hall, where competitors from across the world flocked here to be part of the London Olympics. Those Olympics captured the imagination of the world and they showed Britain at our self-confident best. At the heart of it was one man, Boris Johnson. <laughs> Boris Johnson put London on the map. He was the mayor who cut crime, who built houses, who levelled up all parts of this great city with world-class infrastructure. And having worked with Boris for several years now, I am convinced that he is the man to do that for our entire country. To make our streets safer by backing the police to do their job, to allow enterprise to flourish and to champion entrepreneurs, to level up and unite all parts of Britain with world-class infrastructure, to recapture the spirit of Docklands, with free ports right across the country, including brilliant places like Teesside and Liverpool, to make us a global economic powerhouse, the world's ideas factory. But ladies and gentlemen, in order to do that, we need to deliver Brexit by the 31st of October. <laughs> For the sake of our democracy, for the sake of our sanity, for trust in politics, we must leave the EU on that date. There cannot be any more dither and delay. We're ready for it. Let's get on with it. But for me, this leadership election is about more than just Brexit. It's about having the courage to be Conservatives again, to make the case for Conservative ideas, We've been too afraid to argue for tax cuts, to argue for people having control and freedom over their own lives. Let's be honest, we've stopped inspiring people, instead relying on managerialism and focus group politics. People don't want to be told how to live their lives by the government. They want politicians who are going to inspire them with a positive vision for the future, who are prepared to put themselves out there to take risks and to win over a new generation of young Britons. Now, contrary to popular belief, 
Young people are not commune dwelling, flag waving Corbynistas. They're entrepreneurs, they're innovators. They actually believe in lower taxes than older people. They're more likely to set up their own business. They're more in favour of personal freedom. They want to control their own lives. They want to control their own future. And I believe that Boris is the man who can cut through this cacophony of pessimism, this doom mongering, these people who say that Britain's best days are behind us, that we can't do things anymore. I don't know about you, but I'm fed up of that. Now is the time for a belief in Britain. It's a time for ambition, and it's a time for peddling optimism. <laughs> Boris is the go-getting, enterprise-loving, uplifting British freedom fighter. He is the only person in our party that can take on Corbyn and his socialist cabal. He's an insurgent in a world of incumbents. He's a blonde in the world of the bland. Ladies and gentlemen, can I introduce you to Boris Johnson? Good evening, good evening everybody. Thank you very much Liz, good evening everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you all of you for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming to this, to this climactic, this climactic hustings and Thank you all, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for coming to this climactic hustings of what I think has been a, a, a very, very exciting uh, election campaign that has, I hope you will all agree, done huge credit to our Conservative Party. And thanks to the, everybody who's helped organise, and thanks to Ian Dale, who's done about 15 of these amazing interrogations so far. And of course to, 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 to my opponent, Jeremy. And I, I know that people are a bit down in the dumps about our party at the moment, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe it, this is the, the, the reception here in this hall, but in the last election that we held in this country, we managed to get a staggering total of 8.8%. We saw our wonderful councillors lose many of their seats in the, in the May council elections. More than 1,300 brilliant Conservative councillors went down. And I know that there are some people who are gloomy about our prospects, but I want to tell you all tonight here in this fantastic Excel building that the hour is darkest before the dawn. <laughs> and we are going to turn this thing round. And we're going to come back and we're going to win. And I'll tell you what we're going to do. I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to do, we're going to do several things. First and most important, we need to get Brexit done by October the 31st. And to do that, we need to do some essential things. We need, first of all, to take the provisions for our European Union friends who are living here in this country, working here in this country, the 3.2 million, and we need to pass those protections into law, don't we? We should have done it years ago. Let's do it. Let's put it into law. Number two, we need to take, we need to take the the £39 billion pounds that we're proposing to send to Brussels and uh, place it uh, above the, the, the talks in a, in a state of creative ambiguity until we get the answer that we need. And then, of course, we take the, we take the complex issues, actually not so complex, there are ready solutions to all of them, but we take the questions that are raised by frictionless trade across the Northern Irish border and indeed every other border between the UK and the EU, and we remit them for solution to the place where they properly belong in the context of the free trade agreement that we will strike with our European friends and partners after we have come out on October the 31st. Doesn't that make sense? Yes, it certainly does. That's the way, that is the way forward. And then, and of course, at the same time, we've got to, we've got to get ready. Got, like, as in any negotiation, everybody's done one, everybody knows what, the, what it's about. You have to be prepared to walk away, if you absolutely have to, on different terms, don't you? makes sense and and we will get ready this is a great country we can do it can't we yes we certainly can yes we certainly can and, and I've heard some some gloomed on poppers say that the planes won't fly uh, if we come out with uh, on WTO terms and there won't be any clean drinking water and I've even heard it said I think by the Department of Agriculture that there wouldn't be adequate supplies of milk solids and glucose and whey wherewith to make the Mars bars in Slough on which our children depend 
And I have to tell you, I think, and I, I, I even heard it said that, uh, that somebody at Tesco said there wouldn't be Christmas dinner if we, if we came out without an agreement on October the 31st. Do you really think this great country of ours is incapable of making Christmas dinner, of victualling the people of Britain with Christmas dinner? I tell you, the planes will fly. Whatever deal we do, and it will be a great deal, whatever deal we do, the planes will fly. And there will be clean drinking water, my friends. And there will be adequate supplies of glucose and milk solids and whey to make the Mars bars that we need. Because where there's a will, there's a way, ladies and gentlemen, as you'll have heard several times before in the course of this campaign. And it is then after that that we, of course, well, actually before then, as soon as, uh, if I'm lucky enough to be elected, uh, we get on immediately with a programme of revitalising and reinvigorating our great Conservative Party and our Conservative brand. And what I want to do in a nutshell can be summed up as uniting our country in the way that I was able, I, I think, over the eight years I ran London to unite our city. And I will just remind you that 11 years ago, when I became mayor, we had four of the six poorest boroughs anywhere in the UK. When I stepped down after two terms, we had none of the poorest 20 anywhere in the UK. And the regeneration in this area has been absolutely staggering. And what we did it, we did it by, by some very simple things. We, we drove down crime. And I'm delighted to see uh, my friend and colleague Kit Malthouse uh, over there, James Clever and others, who all of whom had a, played a, a huge part in this. We drove down crime in London by about 20 percent. We've got the murder rate down 50 percent. And you can't fudge that statistic my friends. We got the murder rate down and it ran for fewer than 100 for four or five years whilst I was mayor. An incredible thing for a city uh, of eight or nine million people. And that is what we did by sound conservative policies of backing the police. We also put in fantastic transport infrastructure and we encouraged all sorts of ways in which people on modest incomes were able to take advantage of the opportunities in this extraordinary city. And as a result, at the end, it was the people on uh, the poorest quartile of, the, of Londoners who had seen the biggest increase in their prosperity and their life expectancy. And that is what modern conservatism is all about. That is our moral case to the country. That is what we believe in. We believe in the symmetry, the symmetry between a dynamic market economy and great public services. I want to be the Prime Minister, if I'm lucky enough to get this, who does for Northern Powerhouse Rail what we did for Crossrail, who does for the connectivity in the West Midlands what we did with the tube upgrades. And I want to, I want to level up education funding across this country. Every Conservative surely believes that all the children in this country should have the same basic access to a great education. Let's lift up education funding around this country, raise the, raise the per capita minimum uh, around the UK. And I'll make one final point. It's about education. It's about transport infrastructure. And of course, it's about uh, technology of all kinds. And I'll single out full fibre broadband. Is it not time? that the people of this country had the full fibre broadband, the access to the internet that they deserve. And by the way, the people of Spain already have, I think, 85 or 90 percent coverage, whereas we have only 7 percent. How pa patético, I think is the word I want in Spanish. Uh, absolutely, absolutely pathetic. Uh, in, in Spain, in Pueblos, in Andalusia, they have uh, speed of light access. Here in the UK, we're staring at the pizza of doom uh, in, in towns across the UK. That, that is not right. It's not fair on people in uh, towns, in communities across the, in, in, in rural Britain, which, believe you me, are going to be left behind on current timetables in 2033. 2033 before they get full fibre broadband. We're going to accelerate that programme wrap massively. We're going to give everybody full fibre within the next five years. And that is the way, by education, by infrastructure, by technology, that you level up. You level up and you unleash the talents of the whole country. And people will say, well, how are you, how are you going to pay for these spending commitments? And they're going to ask. And, I, and I've given you the answer already. It's that we Conservatives believe in supporting the wealth creators of our country. And we believe in enterprise. And we understand enterprise. And we, saw, we support the business and the industries and the, and the industries of our country. And we support what they're doing, uh, by the way, not just uh, in, in creating wealth, but also in, in helping to improve the environment. Because it's, it's the breakthroughs in technology 
uh, the battery technology and wind turbines and, and all the rest of it that are helping this country uh, to improve the environment and to reduce CO2 and tackle global warming whilst creating hundreds of thousands of green collar jobs. That is the future for our country, supporting wealth creation, supporting enterprise as a way of protecting the environment and producing jobs at the same time. And of course, there's one man, uh, one group of people who don't get that symmetry and that balance at all, who don't understand the vital importance of wealth creation. You know who I'm talking about. He has an allotment. He has a string vest. He has a, a collection of unsavory views about all sorts of subjects. Uh, I'm talking about Jeremy Corbyn and, of course, uh, the Labour Party. And it's not, just that he's, it's not just that he supports Hamas and Hezbollah and the IRA and he backs uh, the mullahs of Tehran over our friends in the United States when it comes to what is happening in the, in the Persian Gulf. It is far, far worse than that. His economic program would be absolutely catastrophic for this country. He would put up, he would put up taxes. He would put up taxes on inheritance, on pensions, corporation tax up to the highest in Europe, income tax up to 50p. He put up a tax not just on homes, but on gardens, my friends. In fact, I revealed to the people of Seven Oaks the other day and informed them that they have to change their name to Three Oaks after Jeremy Corbyn had finished with them. We, to say, and all to finance, by the way, all to finance his chaotic £300 billion programme of renationalisation. Absolutely disastrous economic programme for this country. We cannot let Jeremy Corbyn anywhere near the government of this country, can we? Absolutely not. No, we're not. We're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. So, we're going to beat him. We're going to beat him. So, we need to get our mojo back as a, as a party. Uh, we need to get on and get out of the EU uh, on October the 31st. Well done. You've been, I'm glad to say you've been, at least one thing has cut through in the course of this uh, election campaign. And uh, if you want to understand, I'll just, I'll just conclude with this. If you want to understand uh, why it is that we must leave the EU and the advantages of coming out of the EU and the ability to take back control of our own democracy and of our own regulatory framework, uh, I want you to consider this Kipper. <laughs> this Kipper, which has been presented to me by, just now by the editor of a national newspaper, who received it from a Kipper smoker in the Isle of Man, who is utterly furious because after decades of sending Kippers like this through the post, he has had his costs massively increased by Brussels bureaucrats who have insisted that each Kipper must be accompanied by a this a plastic ice pillow. <laughs> pointless, pointless, expensive, environmentally damaging elf and safety, ladies and gentlemen. And where, uh, when we come out, therefore, we will not only be able to uh, take back control of our regulatory framework and end this, this damaging regulatory overkill, but we will also be able to do things to boost Britain's economy, which leads the world in so many sectors, bioscience, academia, arts, culture, media, sport, you name it, we lead the world, we lead the world, and we will be able to establish an identity as a truly global Britain and get our mojo back. And uh, by coming out, finally, we will do the most important thing of all, we will restore trust in politics and restore trust in democracy. And we will prick. We will prick the twin puffballs, the twin puffballs of the Brexit Party and the Liberal, pa Liberal Democrat Party that are both sprouting saprophytically, as puffballs do, and feeding on the sense of decay and trust in politics. And when we come out on October the 31st, we will prick those two puffballs. We will bring the Liberal voters back. We will bring the Brexit Party voters back. And we will bring the kibbers back as well. I've been working up to that punchline, as you can tell. And, and, we, will, and we will send... And by so doing, by so doing, we will send Corbyn packing and send him into orbit where he belongs. And I would just remind you, in conclusion, that the last time I was called upon, 
The last time I was called upon to defeat an emanation of the London Labour left, considerably wilier and more devious than Jeremy Corbyn. We came from behind and we defeated him when our great party, the Conservative Party, was 17 points behind Labour in London. We did it then, we can do it again. We can win, we must win, and with your help, we will win. And I hope I can count on your support. Thank you very much. Like your clipper hand. <laughs> it's, 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 it's protected by a very, very stout plastic sheet. I was just worried that I'd shaken him by the kipper hand. It's all right. It's It's not. It's not a red herring. Um, <laughs> it's true, or at least according to the editor of the Daily Express, it's true. So. When will you introduce a Queen's speech into Parliament? I'm not going to comment on our, on our programme, except to say that uh, we will obviously have a, uh, a great programme. Uh, we will be uh, looking to do all sorts of things that uh, I've mentioned, but our, our priority is to get Brexit done uh, on October the 31st. And, uh, and, 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 and I think that's what the people of this country want us to concentrate on. This session of Parliament has gone on for two years or so. It's the longest session since I can remember. It is normal to have a Queen's speech at the beginning of November, which would be a kind of convenient timing, wouldn't it? I, I, you, uh, Ian, you're a brilliant political journalist, uh, and I, 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 I congratulate you on your acumen on this point, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to dissent from you. No, that's, that's, that's a reasonable point. But you know my point is that two weeks before a Queen's speech, you normally prorogue Parliament. That is yes, tradition. Yes, I thought you were working up to that it's one. It's precedent. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were working up to that one. Uh, look, j j I think what your, what your question is, is concealing is, is, you know, do I think that MPs are now psychologically ready to get this thing over the line? Do I, think I, do I think our great party is going to come together and deliver Brexit and restore trust and confidence in, in democracy? Yes, I do. Yeah, i tell you why. Because we are staring down the barrel. And we've seen hundreds of thousands of votes hemorrhage away to, uh, as I say, to the Liberal Democrats and to the Brexit party. Uh, and the same goes for Labour. With, with heroic and superhuman incompetence, they're, they're, they're far below us in the polls. I mean, they're, they're now 18 per cent or something. Uh, they're going to want to get well, this thing actually, done. They're too. actually beating you in the polls, latest polls at the moment. Oh well, okay. Are they? I, I saw one. No, I saw one that put them on 18 percent, but maybe maybe I was a few weeks ago. Um, but when, when you see the the new head of the was it? When you see the someone help me out here. I think there was a recent one. When you see the new head of the European Commission making a speech in the European Parliament, promoting a European army, more European integration, etc., etc., and Michel Barnier making it clear yet again that the withdrawal agreement is not for reopening, how do you, Boris Johnson, think that you are going to get a deal over the line by the 31st of October? They're well, not think, willing to do it, are they? But I think you've, 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 you've with, with huge eloquence uh, and characteristic, you've made the point for me, uh, that the, the EU is proceeding in, in the direction that they are choosing for themselves, uh, with further integration, uh, with moves towards uh, a, a, what is described as a European army. In fact, it won't amount to anything of the, of the kind. But anyway, they want to do uh, much, much more integration, federalist program. That's not right for this country. The British people were asked a question uh, on June the 23rd, 2016. Did they want to remain part of that program? Of, of ever closer union, creating a, a, a sing, effectively a single polity out of 28 countries, you know, a federal program. And they thought about it very deeply, and they decided that on balance they did not want to do so. And they saw a different future for the UK, a global future, rekindling friendships and partnerships around the world as we can and, and we will. And the British people were very confident and optimistic about the fate of their country and what it could achieve. And I think they've been slightly dismayed by the gloom well, and negativity well, that, that, may that has be. risen off the Palace of Westminster. That may and be. And that's why I think MPs are, are, are getting the message and why I think we're going to get it done. But the European Union are not getting the message. That's my point. They won't reopen the withdrawal oh. agreement. Why do you think you're in a better place to get them to do so than your opponent? They regard you very suspiciously, whereas they regard him as someone they can do business with. Well, I, 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 I've, I've no evidence for, the, for your last assertion at all. I, I'm, I have... A, 
great many friends in the EU Council of Ministers. If you want evidence of my ability to negotiate with, with uh, our friends in, in Brussels, look at what we got them to agree to after the Russians poisoned those poor people in, in Salisbury. Uh, we had the French, the Germans, many other European countries immediately coming to the support of the UK and agreeing to expel Russian diplomats, Russian spies, from their own countries, thereby incurring the wrath and reprisals of the, of the Kremlin to show their support and their solidarity with the UK. Uh, we have friends in, in Brussels, uh, we have plenty of people who will want to, uh, to, to uh, negotiate with us throughout the summer, uh, but as I say, if there is a, a refusal to uh, be flexible, if there is a refusal to compromise and do whatever I think everybody can see is sensible, which is to protract the existing arrangements until such time as we can do the free trade deal. If they, if they absolutely won't do that at any price, if they won't change a, a dot or a comma of this withdrawal agreement, and I think, as I say, that it, it's dead and it needs to be, it needs to be junked, uh, then obviously we have no choice but to get ready if, to come out on different terms. If they, that's what we'll do. If they agreed to abolish the backstop, would that be enough for you in terms of the withdrawal agreement, or would, are there other demands that you want to make on? I, I think that the, you know, I think the whole withdrawal agreement is effectively defunct, but the backstop is certainly the bit that I find most difficult. And so is, uh, is and, that a red and, line for you? That would have to go. I, I don't. I, I don't know what everybody here feels, but it, 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 the, the problem with the backstop is. As, as everybody understands it, I think now in this country, is that it poses this appalling dilemma for the UK. You either have to accept that you remain forever within the EU Customs Union and in regulatory alignment with, with Brussels, even though you have no say in setting tariffs or in setting regulations, or else you have to accept that if the, if the UK wanted to do things differently, we'd have to lose control of Northern Ireland. And I think that's an utterly uh, intolerable. Uh, we'd see a division between uh, the, the Union and between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And I think that's an utterly intolerable choice. No democratic country could submit to that kind of choice. And, and we won't do it. So, so as far as I'm concerned, you, you, the backstop won't work. You, you have said that you go. think it's possible to do an initial partial trade deal with the United States before October the 31st. Liam Fox, the International Trade Secretary, says that's impossible. Uh, I, I, well, I, uh, what I've, you said you so, could do it on goods. I, look, I, what I think you could... I, I, I don't know why you, I've said that. What, what, I, what you can certainly do is uh, you can begin... Uh, after we come out on October the 31st, you can begin the work, uh, not just with the US, but with plenty of other countries around the world. Uh, you, you're, you can, once again, the UK will be able to offer its tariff schedules in Geneva and begin the work of doing free trade deals. And that's a very interesting and exciting moment. After 45 years, uh, we will be able to champion free trade around the world to renew old friendships and, and partnerships in a way that we haven't been able to do for a long time. And I think that that will be a, a great thing. And look, I'm not going to pretend I think it's very important for people to understand that a free trade deal with the US is not going to be done in a trice, and it is not going to be something that, um, you know, overnight adds several percentage points to UK GDP. It will add, you know, it will substantially boost our GDP over time, but it's not something that is going to be done instantly. And I also think it's important for people to bear in mind that the US are very tough negotiators. And we will also have to be very tough. And there are huge opportunities in doing a free trade deal with the US. Believe me, the huge opportunities, but they will also make some very robust demands. And we've got to be prepared to be robust in exchange, and we certainly will be. Would you describe yourself as a feminist? Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. yes what, does that, what does that what does that a feminist is somebody a feminist is somebody who believes who believes fundamentally, who believes fundamentally in the equality of human beings and the equality of the sexes. That's what I believe in. So would you... 20% um, tw of the Conservative Parliamentary Party now is made up of female MPs. I think 30% in, 21, uh, in the Cabinet. 21. Is it 21? I think it's um, would you consider introducing all women shortlists in parliamentary selections to get that number up? 
Well, I think that the I don't want to do anything that uh, discourages women from getting into politics. I want to encourage young women to, to get into our uh, to get into politics and to, to join our party and to lead our party. Of course, that's 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 the way it should be. Uh, but I'm not certain that uh, introducing quotas, which after all are by their nature discriminatory, is the way to solve the solve the problem. Uh, I think. Uh, I think the answer, the answer, the answer is 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 to is to is to show what you mean by doing. And when you, if you look at uh, the team I had in City Hall, it was basically I, I, I called it a, a feminocracy. That's a bit of an exaggeration. It was more or less 50-50, uh, the, the top table in uh, in City Hall, uh, and we did you know a huge number of things okay. to promote. Uh, I said the thing I'm proudest of was actually apart from the Russian thing, uh, the thing I, the, the, that we did in the Foreign Office is that we we championed. This is just proof of my feminism, by the way, but it's a, a, a vital point, and all Tories should think about this. We championed 12 years of quality education for every girl in the world and there is I don't think people in this country realize quite how bad the position is in so many other countries around the world uh, whether it's sub-saharan Africa or South Asia you have female illiteracy rates running at 60 percent sometimes 80 percent in some uh, African countries and that is the the core reason for so many of the other problems that we're seeing in, the, in those countries, so whether it's uh, political tensions or, or, or whatever. And if, you, if there's a single sort of Swiss army knife policy to solve the problems of the world, believe me, it is insisting on equality of education between boys and girls around the world and, and 12 years of quality education. Um, Final question. You used the phrase do or die about leaving yes. the EU by I, I didn't mean that literally. I want to, be, I want to stress. I didn't, I didn't. Well, but, on, what, on the on. way in here tonight, um, I asked a couple of senior political journalists what I should ask you tonight. And they said, well, there's only one question on the lips of the lobby today. Does Boris Johnson dye his hair? Dye my hair? No. no, I never. But I, mean, I, don't, I don't normally answer personal questions. But, but since you've, you know, it's an outrageous suggestion. <laughs> So that's a what no. with? Well, I've no idea. <laughs> no, no. Looks perfectly natural to me, no, no. but hey. Right. It's, did, they really it's, ask, did they really ask you? They did ask me to. It shows. Ask. It shows this has been a long election campaign. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they, they've really run out of run out of things to ask. They know what they know what day we're leaving the EU. They know how we're going to do it. They, 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 they're reduced to asking about you know things. That, anyway, there you go. Right. <laughs> Let's see if the audience has got some better questions than that, shall we? Um, I'm going to stand up so I can see properly. We'll start over here. Um, right, let's go to the guy standing up right in the corner there, right at the... Or has he got the microphone? I don't know. Yeah, you, sir. And then in this block, the lady there with the hat. No, in front of the one with the hat. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Uh, hi, Boris. Um, there's a lot of fear-mongering from um, your opponent about the prospects of a general election. Um, do you not think that, in actual fact, it's essential to have a general election in order, to, in order for whoever is the next Prime Minister to have a mandate to go forward and take us out of the EU? Well, uh, thank you. I, I, I think, actually, the people of this country really feel that they've had quite a lot of uh, electoral events in the last few years. There, there was an election in 2015, there was a referendum in 2016, another election in 2017. I think what they want us to do is get on and deliver Brexit. And that's what we're going to do. And I think it would be, that's, that's, that's what they voted for, that's what we're going to deliver, and uh, then we should get on, as I say, with a, this fantastic programme of revitalising our party, pushing out with new power and conviction our, our vision of modern conservatism, which is, I think, a, a great sell for the people. I think the broad mass of the, of the British people will get what we're talking about. We're talking about believing in business and enterprise precisely because that generates great public services. And once people understand, you know, it's a very simple idea, isn't it? Not, it's not rocket But, but if, if Parliament stops science. you from leaving on the 31st of October, and I know you're going to say I'm being a pessimist, but if that happens, you would have no alternative but to call a general election. Well, I, I, I don't think, as I say, I don't think, if I, I've talked to friends in the Labour benches, they don't show any particular enthusiasm for going to the country with their current leader. Let me put it that way. Uh, <laughs> 
and, and, and I don't think anybody in the Conservative Party really wants an election now because we feel that the public have had enough elections. So let's get on, get Brexit done, and, and, and come forward with a fantastic programme for this country, which is what we're going to do. Right. The, the lady with the blue jacket. Lady with the blue jacket, and then we'll come to the gentleman there. Can we get a microphone to the lady in the blue jacket? There, please. There. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Maxine Kerr, and one of the questions that's been burning on my heart for quite some time now is that hashtag ban abortion in 2019. Um, Boris, what are you going to do about the nine million babies that's actually, sadly, lost their lives uh, for the past 52 years. That's what I want to ask you, as well as um, Mr. Hunt as well. Okay, well, thank you very much. Listen, I, I believe, I, I, I've got to say, I believe firmly in a, in a, in a, in a woman's right to, to choose. And uh, I think that um, there is, and this, this is a matter, of, a matter of conscience in our parliament, and, and a matter of conscience in our parliament, that MPs should decide uh, according to their consciences. But that, that's where I am. Right, gentleman there, then we'll go to um, gentleman there in the middle, um, I don't know what, grey shirt, is that grey shirt? Just over there. Good evening. Magistrates' courts have the power to deal with 95% of crime at the moment. Ladies and gentlemen. The present Justice Secretary over here. Oh, sorry. The, the present Justice Secretary Why has plans to abolish sentencing powers for most magistrates' uh, sentences. On the statute books, there is the power to double sentencing. Where do you sit with this? Uh, I, 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 generally, I think that sentencing has, I'm afraid, become too soft. And uh, I think particularly uh, with respect to uh, Serious and violent sexual offences, uh, you're seeing time after time people serving only half the, the, the sentence that was pronounced in open court or, uh, or less. And uh, I think that uh, unless the, there is you know, absolutely overwhelming uh, reasons to the contrary, uh, serious sexual and violent offenders should serve the sentence that they have received. Because I think too many people uh, are coming out on licence and and then, and then actually committing new offences. I think there have been, uh, I, I think, 12 murders committed uh, since uh, 2010 uh, by people out on, uh, who have been released early, murderers who have been re released early. So look, uh, and, and to say nothing of, of, of serious sexual offences of all kinds, too many people are coming out early, the public have spotted it, and we need to do something about it. Right. Um, gentleman there that I put, can we get a microphone to him, please? No, back, back. I don't understand why. You can't see why I'm pointing. Gentlemen, <laughs> or whatever. Right, um, and then the lady down the front here. Good evening, uh, Ian. Good evening, Mr. Johnson. Uh, my name's Darren Green, and although you're refusing, Boris Johnson, to accept the possibility of a general election, if that were to become apparent that it was following and you hadn't put Nigel Farage and the Brexit party in their box, as you said you wish to do, is there any way you could envisage any form of coupon election working with the Brexit party, party to help stop a Jeremy Corbyn government? Well, thank you. Look, I, 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 I want you to know, uh, I think it must have been about 25 years ago or more that I, I met Nigel Farage in a, in a pub uh, for, a, for a historic... Uh, a sort of Cold War meeting in which I tried to recruit him and he tried to recruit me and we both we failed and we went our separate ways and, uh, and actually I, I, I don't believe that we should do deals with any party. We are the Conservative Party, we're a great party and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get this thing done, we're going to get this thing done, we're going to restore trust and confidence in our democracy and then get on with selling our Conservative agenda again. Why would you even meet him? What? Yes. I will rule it out. Yes. I, I rule it out. Why did, why, why did you meet him, though? Thank you. Thank you, thank you for allowing me that important clarification. Uh, 
why did I meet him? I think I was, well, because I think I was, I was then a, I think I was then a journalist, and um, I can't remember what, I think he, All right. I think okay. he was a metals dealer, and he was a metals dealer. And Let's go to the lady in the front row there, <laughs> front row there, and then the gentleman in the white shirt. Um, good evening, everybody, and good evening. Can you stand up? Oh, stand up. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> good evening. And good evening, Boris. Good Bojo. evening. How are good you? Evening. Good evening. My name is Ariola Araba, and um, I want to speak on behalf of a lot of parents who don't know what to do when it comes to teaching their children about managing money. Yes. Six out of ten children are leaving school without the essential skills, and there's high levels of debt, mental health, and everything else. So ca can you tell me exactly what the plans are to help children from primary school age seven to learn how to manage money better? Thank you very much. Thank you. And I, I, it's so interesting. Uh, you know, if you do a long election campaign like this, you start to realize what's, what's on people's minds. And it's, it's so interesting how often this question has, has come up. And clearly, we're not doing enough in our, in our schools to uh, teach kids about money and the management of, of, of their finances. And it, of course, it's critical for people because their lives can go off the rails simply by making a few uh, elementary mistakes. And they, can, and they can be helped. And of course, the answer is better education, as, as you rightly say, uh, both in primary school and in secondary school. We're going to put more money into, uh, into primary school. We're going to raise, as I said, we're going to lift up, level up the funding to 4,000, a minimum of 4,000 uh, per pupil in primary, a minimum of 5,000 per pupil in, in secondary. And I will, I will look, I will consider, having listened to this campaign very carefully, I will consider what we can do uh, when, uh, if, if I'm lucky enough to, to become leader, I will consider with the, the, the next education secretary or the, whoever is education secretary, uh, I will consider what we could do to uh, inculcate better understanding of finances amongst young people because it's been raised with me so often that I, it, it's clearly something we need to address. Are, are you good at managing money? I'm, uh, I've, you know, I, I, I got into terrible, I think you asked me a question about my personal, no it wasn't you, it was Hannah who asked me a question, but it was, it was, I'm sorry, I'm forgive me. it was Hannah. Um, <laughs> What can I say about it? I certainly, I certainly, I I certainly spent a lot. Yes, yes. 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 Well, if you're going to be First Lord of the Treasury, you need yes. to be quite good at managing money. Yes. Well, I, don't, I, yes, I know, but I, yes, I, I, I'm all right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, gentleman there, followed by the lady there. Hello. Just following on from the question about managing money, the fact is you have, you have pledged a program of increased public spending and cutting taxes. How will you pay for this without increasing the deficit? Because it was the great Tunisian sage, Ibn Khaldun in the 14th century, who pointed out that there are some taxes that you can cut that actually stimulate economic growth. And I think Ibn Khaldun observed that when it came to... When it came to, I think it was the, the, the date harvest in or whatever, olives or something in, in 14th century Tunisia. I can't remember exactly what it was, but they cut the, they cut the tax on, on, on which, was, which was too high. And the farmers grew more dates or olives and uh, the tax yield went up accordingly. And uh, that is an approach that whenever corporation tax is cut, it yields more money. We should be cutting business taxes now. We should be stimulating growth, stimulating the economy. We, we should also be doing things, as I said uh, just now, to take the other burdens off business. And if businesses are uh, obliged to send, as I say, plastic ice pillows through the post when they, they used to just send a kipper uh, before and, uh, and suddenly their profit margins are destroyed, there are things that we will be able to do when we come out of the EU that we weren't able to do before. But the, but the most important thing to do is to use fiscal measures to stimulate economic growth and champion business, and that is what we will do. And don't forget, um, just to come back to my crucial point, the reason our mission here today is so important is that there is another political party that has a diametrically opposite philosophy and thinks that they can continue to pluck, how shall I put it, pluck the feathers of the, of the, if you imagine the UK economy as, 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 as have a beautiful two-winged bird, right? But most beautiful birds have two wings. Uh, <laughs> if, if, if this, if this bird, one is the is the is the free market side of the economy, the other is great public services and infrastructure, and, and both you need both to propel the other. But Labour 
with a huge agenda of taxation would pluck so many feathers from the wealth creating side of the economy, from that wing, that we would go into a kind of death spiral. And that is what we have to avoid. That is, that is, the, that is the danger. And we've got to, and it's not just, it's not just, it's not just, uh, it's not just uh, um, Jeremy Corbyn. It's, it's John McDonnell. John McDonnell is so left wing. He, John McDonnell is so he was actually sacked by Ken Livingston for, <laughs> for forging for forging a budget in 1984. I mean, this guy uh, he's you know he's a crypto. Well, I'm going to be careful what I say. Actually, he's not. He's a he's a he's a he's a, he's a Marxist basically, and uh, he would do colossal damage. He's a um, Marxist. Just talking first budgets, Jeremy Hunter said he would cut corporation tax to 12.5% in his first budget. Is that yes. something you would commit to? I, I, I've, I've been very careful. I will cut corporation tax. I've, I've, I've made, uh, actually, my spend, I forgot to say, my spending commitments so far uh, in this uh, election campaign have been extremely modest by comparison with the remaining other candidate. That's what I'm just putting that point out there. Uh, <laughs> They've been very, very fiscally prudent. But they will do great things. They will, we will do great things. With that spending on infrastructure and on education but, uh, and on policing, another, another, another more than a billion pounds will put into 20,000 policing. To, to answer I think that's my the right question, thing to do. will you cut corporation tax to 12.5%? I I, I'm not going to give a figure, but we'll certainly cut corporation okay. tax. We'll make it very competitive. Right. Um, gentleman, no, the lady over there, I do apologise. And then the gentleman at the back with the turban. Hello everyone, my name is Faisal Howell, can you hear me? Yes. We live in a world of instant gratification, sense of entitlement, hashtag instant outrage. How are you going to champion a return to common sense and civil debate? Thank you so much. Well, I, I do agree. Um, I, I, look, we have, we have in this country, and it's absolutely vital that we do, we have uh, very important laws against hate speech, against xenophobia, against discrimination uh, and, and, and racial prejudice of all kinds. And it's right that we should enshrine those protections in law. We can be very, very proud of what we have achieved. But we also have a tradition of robust debate and free speech. And if I may say so, I think sometimes we need to be, um, we need to be prepared to, be, to say things that we think without necessarily getting our heads bitten off by absolutely everybody. So, and so I, let me put it that way. But, 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 but without inciting any of the, uh, of the prejudices and, uh, and hatreds that I described, and they can be done. Do you think Donald Trump should do that? <laughs> do what? Well, just tone it down a little bit. Well, I, I, I think I said something the other night uh, that, uh, that you know, made clear that if, you, if you're talking about uh, what he well, what his, the his tweets said. about oh, um, yes um, I think it was look I mean I, I, I'll repeat it in case you missed it uh, I think it's totally unacceptable for the leader of a great multicultural multiracial society to start using the language of sending people back home Is I it? mean that that went out a long time ago and it just isn't on and you know I, I'm incredibly proud. I'm incredibly proud of, uh, of, of, of you know, having cunningly stationed my ancestors around the world uh, before I became foreign secretary. Uh, the, 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 the people that I was proud to be mayor of is the most diverse, the most diverse city on earth. And we can be incredibly proud of that because it, it shows what an amazing magnet we are for talent. And there, there are 300 languages spoken on the streets of London. So, so yeah, of course, I, I deprecate that but, kind of language. But if you use that kind of language and talk about sending people home, that is racist language. Right. Why won't you or Jeremy Hunt call it out for what it is? I think I've, I think I've made my position use clear. Use the word. Use the word. I, I think I've made my position clear on that. And uh, I think that the President of the United States used language that was unacceptable. And that is my view. Okay. Right, gentlemen there. And then um, the one person waving right at the back there. Thank you. Uh, please allow me to begin with a say greeting. Wahiguji ka khalsa, Wahiguji ki fateh. I've got a very serious question, Boris. It's regarding um, the British citizens which are detained and tortured abroad. So, British citizen Jotar Singh Johal 
He's in India, yes. 621 days. Yes. Then we got Nazneen. Yes. She's in Iran at the moment. Yes. So what's your commitment when you become prime minister to release them both and bring them back to UK? Well, thank, thank you. you so much. And, thank you, sir. Uh, and I have, as, as you know, as you know, I have I've lobbied on behalf of both those individuals, and, and if I'm lucky enough to be elected, I will continue uh, to lobby on behalf of them. But I, I think I, I would want to pay tribute to the amazing work that is done by our uh, foreign office uh, around the world. We have a huge number of really tragic uh, consular cases around the world, and the foreign office do an amazing and unsung job of helping those people in their circumstances and helping many of them to get home. Right. Uh, the gentleman at the back waving again. Have you got the microphone, sir? I hope you have. And then we'll go to the gentleman there who's doing an unfortunate salute. <laughs> I, bet he, I bet it was wholly accidental. It was accidental, I know. Good evening, everyone. I hope everyone can help me. Hi, Boris. Hi, Boris. Evening. He's, he's right at the back there. Um, yeah. I just want to ask, um, how will you ensure the government's um, housing policies don't lend themselves in creating ethnic ghettos inadvertently. Shall I tell you what you do? It's very, very simple. Uh, you build fantastic housing in the right place and you put in superb transport infrastructure so that you can create mixed communities where there are high quality jobs. Uh, and and the, the, if you look at the disasters of planning in the uh, 60s and 70s where monocultural estates were built, it was because there simply wasn't the transport infrastructure. Look around uh, London and look at the estates outside, and you can see exactly what went wrong. So what we should do is we should immediately get rid of the current useless mayor of London, uh, Sadiq Khan, uh, who is doing nothing. And we should, he's not a patch on the old guy. Not, we should get rid of him. We should get, he's doing absolutely, he's completely invertebrate. We should, we should get rid of him. And we should, we should get on with fantastic projects like extending the Bakerloo line, put, which would allow you to build loads of uh, new homes down the, oh, down in southeast London. Uh, do Crossrail 2, fantastic scheme. Crossrail 2 would, would liberate brownfield sites, brownfield sites in northeast London, uh, enabling you to deliver about 200,000 high quality homes uh, within reach, within reach of the central activity zone of, of London. All the, the dynamism of the metropolis, you'd get mixed communities there. You'd, you'd get, of course, you'd get huge numbers of affordable homes, huge numbers of homes for people on low incomes, but you'd get all types of people living there. That is what you need to do. Fantastic transport infrastructure liberating brownfield sites. That's what we're going to do. And that's why I made such a, a, an emphasis in my, my speech earlier on about what I want to do with high quality mass transit. It is the great liberator and equalizer of society. If people on modest incomes can get to their place of work, then you will, you will eat cheaply and conveniently, you will transform their lives. And the problem with those estates in the, in the 60s and 70s was there was no easy way to get to the jobs. That's what we've got to do. Right, we have, we have three minutes left. So we can put two more questions in. Boris, if you can keep your answers relatively short on these two. Right, the gentleman over there, um, do you have a microphone? Can we have a microphone over there, please? And then, um, see, seeing as you pointed so nicely, why not? Thank you very much indeed. If I ask my question, if I may, Boris, no, I'm over no, here no, waving. No, 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 sir. It was that, that gentleman there. Sorry. No, you. Yeah. Can we come to the other chap next? If we, no, we're coming down here now. Oh, sorry. Hello, uh, good evening, Boris and everyone. My name is Asifi Yu. I'm a former Conservative councillor. When you become our PM, how would you enhance and develop positive relationship of Conservative parties with British Muslims living in UK, as large majority of them don't vote for our party, although their values and principles are closer, closely aligned to our Conservative party? It could be crucial for our next general election as Muslim vote bank can swing over 72 parliamentary constituencies. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, uh, we, we're absolutely right. And, and we must, 
and uh, if I'm lucky enough to be elected, I will of course be uh, leading an immediate program of engagement, uh, not just with the, the Muslim community, but with all the communities that make up our, our incredible society. I will get into it, I will get into the mosques, I will do all, everything that you would expect me to do, and I will rem remind them uh, in, in the tedious, repetitive way that I always do, that I'm, uh, the only reason I'm here is because my Muslim great-grandfather came in 1912 to Wimbledon, of all places, uh, in fear of his life. Uh, and there you go. Okay. Without, without which, uh, and if it hadn't been for the generosity and openness of, of, of our society, even in 1912, he would not have come to London and to the, and to the, and to the UK. So what I want is a, is a country, is a country that, that breathes that spirit of generosity to everybody who lives here. That is what I want. I want a spirit of generosity and inclusion to absolutely everybody. Right. Uh, um, our final question comes to, I think, our youngest questioner of the whole hustings. Right. Hello. Um, hello, Boris. Um, when you are prime minister, how will you stop climate change? Thank you. Well, I, I, listen, I, it's, it, it's, everyone already heard the question. Uh, I, I salute Theresa May and, and, and uh, uh, she, what, she, what she's done in many ways, but particularly in setting the, 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 the carbon neutral target by 2050. I, it sounds ambitious, it sounds crazy, it sounds like we're chucking the ball too far down the pitch, but we can do it. Uh, we, can, we, can, we, can, we can reduce uh, climate change causing gases and pollution of all kinds, and we do it with new technology. That's what we do. And, and uh, as I was saying earlier on, this is the country that is pioneering revolutionary battery technology, revolutionary wind turbines. It's our technological, I see Nigel Hudson who point, 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 pointed that out to me uh, a, a while back. Uh, it, is, it is revolutionary battery technology that is enabling this country uh, and, and uh, all sorts of green technology that is enabling this country to take the lead in tackling climate change. When I was mayor of this amazing city, uh, the population increased by about 200,000 in eight years. No, absolutely nothing to do with me, but it did. There you go. And uh, what, what happened uh, at the same time, of course, was that GDP went up massively. Economic growth was phenomenal. Just look around, look at what the building and construction that's going on in the city. And yet, in that period, we cut CO2, by four, CO2 emissions by 14%. We cut uh, NOx, uh, I think, by about 20% and, and particulates by about 16%. And that was because we used fantastic new technology. We improved boilers across the city. We did elementary things to reduce CO2 emissions. So you should be very, so every, see, I know you're very, you, you, you're very young, quite, and it's fantastic to see you here, but be optimistic about the future of our country, uh, because we can, and, and of the planet. Uh, because we can do it, we, there, are, there, are the, there are the technological changes uh, that we can make, and this country is in the lead. And as for everybody else, I would also be optimistic uh, uh, about not just about our country, but also about our party. And I think that you probably want me to leave the stage at this stage. We're kind of getting there, yeah. <laughs> Boris Johnson, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> On the 20th of June, 2019, it was announced that the final two candidates would include Boris and the man who I'm proud to support. After hours of debating, endless interviews and touring up and down our fantastic country, it's come down to this. The final hustings, the final chance to appeal for your vote. I started off this campaign backing Boris. I believed initially being a lever, it made me a natural Boris supporter. But as the campaign played out, Plans were published and personalities shown, and I came to realise I could not do that with a clear conscience. So I made the move that people up and down the country and United Kingdom have been doing and switched to Hunt. I stand here today committed and proudly supporting Jeremy, the man who has taken social media by storm with his sass, witty personality and infamous pizza photo. <laughs> showing a genuine, truthful side to him which has resonated across the country. It's been said time and time again that we are facing turbulent challenges. Our union is under threat. There is uncertainty around Brexit and support for our party is sadly dwindling. In times like these, we need someone who the public can trust and invest in. 
Someone who respects the sovereignty of the Union and also respects the democratic mandate of Brexit. Most importantly, someone who will not only re-establish our party as the party of business, but also the party of hope and opportunity. As I am sure everyone here is aware, Jeremy is an entrepreneur. So, so who better to make the case to the EU than an experienced negotiator from his own business to cabinet level? Someone who will bring business back to Britain and fight to keep our union together, as he said, with every drop of blood in his veins. The public service reformer who will scrap, scrap illiteracy and with his NHS background transform social care for the elderly, not forgetting the foreign secretary who has the expertise, relationships and respect that we will need to rely on post Brexit. We are facing a battle, not only to unite our party, but to keep Jeremy Corbyn out of number 10. The next election we face will not be easy, and we need a strong Prime Minister who will lead from the front. Let's not forget that Jeremy would be the first Prime Minister to have taken a Lib Dem marginal seat. That is campaign experience which cannot be overlooked. I want our next Prime Minister, as I'm sure you all do as well, to know what it's actually like to fight tough battlegrounds alongside activists like all of us here. So I'm going to leave you now with a quote by Sir Raymond Priestley, explorer and geologist, that seems very fitting to welcome the son of a naval officer. For scientific discovery, give me Scott. For speed and efficiency of travel, give me Amundsen. But when disaster strikes and all hope is gone, get down on your knees and pray for Shackleton. Jeremy is the modern day Shackleton that our country is desperately crying out for. So I hope you will all join me in welcoming the man who will steer our ship through turbulent water to a prosperous future. Our next Prime Minister, Jeremy Hunt. Great, great job, great, great job. Go for it. Hi, Ian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What an introduction. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, Eleanor is just 21 years old. She has given a speech. She's given a speech to nearly 5,000 people in the Excel Centre. I'm humbled by what she said, and I'm also proud that she wants to be a Conservative MP, and aren't we lucky? And I want her to know that she has been here, done that and got the t-shirt. Here you are, Anna. And while we're talking about t-shirts and slogans, I want to thank the genius in my campaign team who came up with the slogan, has to be Hunt, because with a surname like mine, when you think what it rhymes with, coming up with a slogan is a very, very important thing to get right. And we had some great suggestions from the internet we had hashtag take a punt on Hunt. We had um, hashtag Jezza's the Bezza. And then when I'm not quite so keen on, hashtag Hunty McHuntface. Just be very careful how you say that one at home because we are the party of the family. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, what a fantastic contest we've had as it draws to a close. And I'm standing here with the privilege of telling you the things I want to change as Prime Minister in our amazing country. And to govern is to choose, and I have chosen four priorities, and I'm going to tell you all of those priorities. But we can't deliver any of them until we sort Brexit. And I want to answer a question that may be on some people's minds. How can you trust someone who voted Remain to deliver Brexit? And I want to answer that question very directly. As Foreign Secretary, I go around the world, and the most striking thing when I'm representing our country is that wherever you go, other countries have a whole lot more respect for us than we sometimes seem to have for ourselves.
And the reason is because we are one of the oldest and greatest democracies in the world. We have done more to fight for our freedom and the freedom of other people and other people's democracies than nearly anyone else. And it's not just World War II. It's the barons of Magna Carta, the Great Reform Act, the suffragettes. And the reason that I am going to deliver Brexit for our country as Prime Minister is because I want to send a message to people at home and people abroad that we are still that great democracy that does what the people tell us to do. No matter the obstacles Parliament may put in our way, the hurdles our European colleagues may throw in front of us, this is a country where people like me do what people like you, the people, tell us to do because democracy is in our DNA and you cannot put a price on it. And there's something else that's incredible about our country, which is at crucial moments in our history, we have been bold. Ralph Waldo Emerson, the American writer, once said, do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there's no path and leave a trail. And that's what we've always done. The boldness of abolishing the slave trade, the boldness of banning children from going up chimneys and making them go to school, the boldness of the suffragette movement, the boldness of setting up the NHS, which contrary to popular myth was a conservative minister in 1944. Let's hear it for Sir Henry Willing. But we haven't just been bold, we've been smart. We've thought with our heads as well as believing with our hearts. And that's what we have to do with Brexit, because if we do this in a gung-ho way, if we go about it the wrong way, the Europeans will block any changes to the deal, Parliament will block no deal, and we'll get to a general election long before we get to October the 31st. And we are going to overcome those hurdles by telling the Europeans politely but firmly that if we don't get a deal that can get through Parliament, there won't be a deal, but we're still leaving. And we will tell Parliament that just like them, we will leave no stone unturned to find a deal. Because the quickest way to leave the European Union is to send a Prime Minister to Brussels who can negotiate a deal that will get through Parliament. That's what I'm going to do as Foreign Secretary, as an entrepreneur. That's why Penny Mordaunt and Liam Fox and other Brexiteers are supporting me, because I will deliver that for Britain. Now, did I just mention that I was an entrepreneur? <laughs> have, you, have you heard that one before, Ian? Times. Um, I'm glad you've been paying attention. I, I want to do something that I have done at every hustings, just because it says something about our incredible party. I want you to put up your hand if you've started your own business. J just, just look around. Would you find this at a Labour Party gathering? Would you find it with the Lib Dems? We are the party of wealth creators, and let's send a message now from the Conservative Party to every entrepreneur in the country. Thank you for the brilliant things you do for our country. And this is the first of my four priorities. I want to do what I did when I was in my 20s, I want to help other people do the same thing. I want to fire up our economy to be the most pro-enterprise, pro-business, greenest, high-tech economy in Europe. And our big opportunity with the top universities in the world in our country, more tech entrepreneurs, more medicines being developed, our big opportunity is to be the world's next Silicon Valley. And I'm going to take a giant step towards that by the most radical cuts in business taxation we've ever seen, cutting corporation tax to 12.5% Irish levels. <laughs> 90% of high street businesses out of 
business rates, which is a curse for all of them. And other tax cuts too, because I want to land an economic jumbo jet. There's one up there now. I want to land perfect timing. Um, it has to be Hunt. Um, I want to. I want to land an economic, an economic jumbo jet on Europe's doorstep. So when it comes to those trade negotiations, they need us every bit as much as we need them. And that's my first objective. The second, I am the Foreign Secretary who wants our great country to walk tall in the world. And hasn't our Navy been brilliant in the last week protecting British shipping? And I'm going to increase the proportion of our GDP that we spend on defence to 2.5%, and I'm going to do it because the threats are rising in the Gulf and with Russia. But I'm going to do it for another reason, which is at the point of Brexit, I want the world to see that Britain, that country that has always fought for democratic values, Britain is here, Britain is back, our voice is strong in the world, and we will fight for the things we believe in. And then as Conservatives, we have to have a social mission. People know that we are wealth creators, but they don't always know about our compassionate conservative values. Now, I ran the NHS for nearly six years. I was so proud to do that. But I want our social mission to be in education. Because in our great country, in this great city, sadly, still nearly a quarter of primary school leavers don't end up being able to read properly. And, you know, we are the party that believes in opportunities for everyone. We want to put a ladder of opportunity in front of every single young person. And whether they climb that ladder is up to them. But the first rung on that ladder is to be able to read properly. So I want us to be the Conservative government that abolishes the scourge of illiteracy in our society. And that is what I'm going to do. And then finally, I want to make you a political promise to my friends in the Conservative Party. I promise you that I will not take us into a general election until we have got more young people voting Conservative. We cannot be the party of aspiration if the most aspirational people in our country aren't supporting us. So I will deal with the unfairness of 6% interest rates on student loans. Just as Margaret Thatcher put 1.5 million council tenants on the housing ladder, I'm going to put 1.5 million young people on the housing ladder. I'm going, to I'm going to tackle climate change because I want pollution-free cities in our country within 10 years. But I'm going to do all of this for another reason, which was the heart of Corbyn's success at the last election, was his ability to attract young people with fake and bogus promises. We want them back, and we are not going to ignore a Labour Party under Corbyn, which is the most ruthless, dangerous, anti-British, anti-Western, anti-Semitic, hard-left cabal we've ever had in British political history. Get this wrong, and there will be no Conservative government, no Brexit, maybe even no Conservative party. But get this right, get this right, and we will deliver Brexit, unite our party, unleash the potential of our great country, and send Corbyn packing. And one Final thing, ladies and gentlemen. I've, uh, I've noticed the odd back Boris poster around. Give yourselves a cheer. I've noticed an awful lot of has to be hunts. Give yourself a cheer.
Now, Bruce Forsyth once said, remember only half the audience are ever going to like you. Don't worry about the other half, the bastards. <laughs> but, but when it comes to the Conservative Party, Brucey was wrong, because after this contest, we are going to unite the back Borises and the has to be hunts. We're going to come together. Because that's what our party wants and that's what our country deserves. Thank you very much. The most populist there. <laughs> Um, Jeremy, this time next week, either you or Boris will be about to spend your first night in Downing Street. Um, if you don't win, if, do you want to keep your current job? If I don't win, uh, it would be a huge honour to serve Boris in a way that unites our party and our country. And I know Boris would say the same. Um, I don't quite know it. I think I know it. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it. <laughs> if you do win, when would you have a Queen's speech? Ah, there's a very good question. And uh, uh, I think perhaps this is not the moment to make that announcement, if you'll forgive me. And I pride myself on answering the question very directly. But um, uh, I've said that I won't prorogue Parliament to force through a no-deal Brexit. I don't think you can do that in a parliamentary democracy. Uh, but, the, but, th but this Parliament has been going on for two and a half years now. It's the longest Parliament I yeah. can remember. Um, there is precedent and tradition that before you have a Queen's speech, you do prorogue Parliament for a couple of weeks. And it is also traditional to have a Queen's speech in the first week of November. Go figure. Yes. Um, well, uh, the first week of November is, of course, a very significant week because it happens to be the week of my birthday. Um, but, um, look, we will need to have a Queen's speech soon. If you listen to the things I was talking about in that speech, uh, there's a lot of things there that need legislation. Uh, we will need to have a, a budget very quickly. And by the way, the, the thing I will commit to tonight is that we will have a budget with the preparations for a no-deal Brexit and those big business tax cuts in the first week of September. And, uh, and then we'll have the Queen's speech at the, the earliest available and sensible. But if you can give me a date for a budget, why can't you give me a date for a Queen's speech? Uh, because much as I love you, Ian, and we've got to know each other over the last few steady, weeks, I steady. can't... Uh, <laughs> um, you don't want to lose all over that, do you? <laughs> uh, um, I, uh, I, I think there are some things that we don't need to talk about okay. in the public arena. So, the withdrawal agreement, is it dead? As it is now, Yes, um, we have to be, I, I wanted to get a deal, and so we have got to make some profound changes to that withdrawal agreement. That doesn't mean ripping up the whole thing, but it does mean that the backstop has to go. Go entirely or be amended? Well, the reason why our parliament did not accept the backstop is because it traps us in the EU customs union tariffs until such time as the EU gives us permission not to follow EU tariffs. And that is not acceptable. It won't get through Parliament, and that is what has to go. If you're saying that we will remove any guarantees over not having hard border infrastructure on the island of Ireland, then no, I think there is agreement in our party that we can never go back to a hard border on the island of Ireland. Uh, Pretty Patel is nodding, so I'm feeling safe saying this one. Um, but I think it's clear, I think it's absolutely clear that whoever takes over as Prime Minister will be absolutely committed to the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, one of the greatest achievements of British diplomacy of the last 30 years. 
but I, I often get calls from my LBC listeners saying, well, the, the difference between Jeremy Hunt and Boris Johnson is that we can trust Boris Johnson because we know he feels Brexit in his gut, whereas Jeremy Hunt doesn't because he voted Remain. Now, you did address that in your speech. I completely get that. But how do you Ian, address I that I feel problem? democracy in my gut, and that is why I'm going to deliver Brexit. Why do you think, though, that you can deliver a deal in the way that Boris Johnson couldn't? Well, Boris can speak for himself, but what I would say is that my experience as Foreign Secretary, uh, my background as a negotiator before I came into business, um, and my ability to say tough things, which I've had to say, incidentally, to uh, the Chinese government over Hong Kong a couple of weeks ago to President Trump last week, uh, you know, with some very difficult disputes when I was running the NHS, the ability to say tough things that need to be said whilst maintaining relationships and having negotiations is an important quality that I've demonstrated throughout my life. But what I won't say, as someone who's seen a lot of deals over the years, is that this is going to be easy, but nor is it going to be impossible. And we have overcome bigger challenges in the past, and we can overcome this one as well. Uh, you mentioned Donald Trump there, and you rightly, I think, called him out for his tweets this week about the four uh, congresswomen. But neither you nor your opponent actually used the word racist. Why not? Because. I am the country's diplomat in chief, and I have responsibility for our relationship with our most important ally. And that relationship, by the way, is the foundation of the peace and prosperity that we've had in the world for the last 75 years. And I have to recognize... <laughs> ..that the words I use needs to be calibrated in a way that doesn't do lasting damage to that relationship. But I think I made my feelings very clear. I think I said in that Sun debate that I've got three half Chinese children born on the NHS with British passports. I would be utterly appalled, horrified. It would be totally unacceptable to me or my wife if anyone ever told them to go back to China. And I hope no politician in this country ever would. Are you a feminist? I like to think so, yes. What does it mean? Uh, well, of course it means equality between men and women, but it also means being prepared to smash the glass ceilings uh, that have existed for centuries that stop women reaching their full potential. Um, it means backing more women MPs, and we've made great progress in the Conservative Party, but not enough. Still only 20%. Exactly. Uh, I've been a big supporter of Anne Jenkins' work with Women to Win. It means... <laughs> it means more female cabinet ministers. It means doing everything possible to do what we Conservatives believe in, which is no matter who you are, your background, your sexuality, or your sex, we are the party of meritocracy, and everyone should be allowed to flourish and prosper. Um, David Cameron had the A-list, which helped a lot of women get selected and elected in 2010. Would you propose something similar? Would you uh, be in favour of all women shortlists in some seats? I'm not in favour of all women shortlists, because... Because we are a meritocracy, and I think the risk is that that devalues the achievement that a woman makes when she achieves a job, if she thinks she got it because of her sex. But that doesn't mean there aren't a thousand other things we can do to help uh, people reach their potential, and I think that's what we're all about. Um, now, I did ask Boris Johnson if he dyed his hair. Um, can I ask you the same question, just out of balance? <laughs> uh, no. Sorry to disappoint. I've got a few grey ones, mind you. Might have to start. I'll tell you what, you'll have a few more if you get this job. 
says he. <laughs> okay, final question from me. If you could steal something from your opponent's personality, what would it be? Well, I worked with Boris on the London Olympics, and uh, he was mayor and I was culture secretary. And in fact, a number of events were held here in, in the Excel Center. And um, we used to meet you know, every few weeks, and it didn't matter how serious or difficult the topics were that we were discussing. We always left those meetings with a smile on our face. And I think that's a great quality. Great. Right. Let's start the question and answer session, and we'll start right over there. Lady waving there in the, is it a green cardigan? And then there was somebody here, you. Thank you. Uh, Virginia Sorry, Crosby, di she? Director of Women to Win. Ah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jeremy. Um, the number of women um, voting in the 2017 general election for the Conservatives declined dramatically. How are you going to get women to vote Conservative again? Thank you, Virginia. Well, I think the polling evidence is that one of the reasons that the number of women voting for us declined, and by the way, we can't win unless we get a majority of women voting for us, which is why this issue matters to us so much. But the reason is because that was an election where most of the discussion in one way or another was about Brexit. And that's why we've got to get Brexit done, delivered behind us, and then talk about a broader canvas of issues such as public services, particularly education. Uh, we were on the back foot on education and school funding in the last election. That's why it's essential that we sort that out. And by the way, I would do this in the way that I, I did it with the NHS. I would put more money on the table, but I'd say I want a 10-year plan that's going to show me how we're going to make sure that young people who don't go to university get properly rigorous technical qualifications so we know they can get a decently paid job. Uh, I want to see how we're going to abolish illiteracy. And if you can show me how you're going to do that, I'll put more money on the table. And I think talking about those other issues is how we'll succeed, Virginia. Right. You, sir, then will go over here in the green. Mr. Hunt, I would like to pro probe you further on a point that you made previously about the uh, about getting youth back into conservatism. Now, we all know that the education system is massively towards the left. There's a far greater representation of the left than there is the right and conservatism. What I want to know from you, sir, I want to know how you are going to bring conservatism back into the education system. How you are going to free the education system from the grips of socialism. Thank you. I. I... Love the socialist clenched fist there. <laughs> Rusha, I, I've, I've spotted the next William Hague. Um, fantastic. Um, look, I'll tell you what we've got to do. We've got to make sure that we have properly, we are properly defending free speech on our campuses. And we cannot have a situation. <laughs> we cannot have a situation where people are harassed or intimidated or feel threatened because they do something as bold as to say they are a conservative. And as a, to my knowledge, there is only one vice chancellor in the whole country who openly says that he supports the conservatives. And I think we need a bit of uh, honesty from the vice chancellors in this country that what has made this country great is free debate, enlightenment values, uh, getting rid of the Spanish Inquisition and the great things that happened in our universities before they happened anywhere else. And we need to stay true to those principles today as we always have done. Why, why, why should university vice chancellors declare their political allegiance? They shouldn't declare it, but I'm just making... Everyone can decide if they want to do that or not, but I'm just making the point that of our 300 universities, the fact that there is only one that feels able to declare that is an indication of just how difficult it is to support the Conservatives in academia, okay. and that isn't right. Right, lady there, and then gentleman in the front row of the second section there, waving his hand in the blue jacket. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Jeremy. And that was a good speech. My name is Shane Walker. Um, my question, at the last election, I actually stood to become a counselor in that ward. And each time I told my friend, I was standing as a conservative candidate. They were shocked because I'm from the ethnic minority, right? What are we doing to actually change the perception of people that we are actually diverse and inclusive, that we are not just a party for the white, the black, uh, the, the white and the male, like everybody says, that we are actually inclusive because the perception is everything. Everybody perceives that when you are standing, especially from the ethnic minority, you are, you are actually standing for labor. What Thank you. is your plan? Well, Shimwake, let me say, first of all, Thank you for standing up for your beliefs, um, because we are proud to have you as a conservative. I noticed the back Boris badge, but I've got a has to be hum one to give you in a minute. Um, and, um, and the answer to your question uh, is this. Who are the most socially diverse colorblind group of people in our society. It's young people. They are the people who, who really don't notice if someone has a different color to their skin. And so the way we are going to increase the diversity in our own party is by getting more young people involved. And that's why I want them to know as a businessman, uh, the most powerful thing that you can say to a customer is that you're hungry for their business. And I want every young person in this country to know that we, the Conservatives, are hungry for their votes because we offer them the brightest and best future. We're going for it, and we can prove that with the policies that we're going to announce. Right, the gentleman there, then the guy right by the wall who's doing this. Jeremy, the social care system in this country is broken. As a former Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, how will you fix it? Thank you. Uh, and a great question. Because we are the party that believes in fairness between the generations. And there is no Conservative in this hall that doesn't want every single older person in our country to be treated with dignity and respect. And very frankly, sir, if I was going to talk about the austerity cuts that I had to bring in as part of David Cameron's cabinet in 2010, I think there were two areas where, with the benefit of hindsight, and it's easy to say these things, they went too far. And one of them was police numbers, and one of them was the social care system. So how do we solve it? I think uh, we've got to do two things. First of all, local councils do need more money to deliver a basic standard of care in social care. And I want a 10-year plan for the social care system, just as I delivered a 10-year plan for the NHS. That was actually my next job. But secondly, it is also about personal responsibility. And we need to encourage more younger people to save for those costs in the very last few months of their lives earlier, just as they save for their pensions. And in this country, after the war, we set up a very strong pension system, which made it the norm. And under uh, our Conservative government, we made it even stronger by introducing auto-enroll. And I would like to have a similar system of auto-enroll so that people are automatically putting aside a little bit more for their social, costs to, social care costs towards the end of our life, their lives, so that gradually we move to a society in which people are saving enough. It'll take time, but I think it's the right thing to do. Just to, just to follow up on that, um, I remember Andy Burnham, Andrew Lansley and Norman Lamb got together, I think it was in 2009, to talk about the future of social care, 10 years ago. You were Health Secretary for six years, I take the point about austerity, but do you not think it was a failure on your part not to prioritise social care during your period as Health Secretary? Well, um, I was formally responsible for it for my last six months in the job, but I was very concerned about the social care system because I could see uh, our A&E's filling up around the country because hospitals couldn't find care packages in the community. And I became absolutely convinced that you can't solve the problems of the NHS without addressing the problems in the social care system at the same time. So I do think this is something that we need to do now. Right. Have we got um, the guy at the, in the corner by the wall? Are you ready? 
right, we're going to go to you, and then we will go to you, sir. Uh, good evening, Mr. Hunt. My name is Asha Massey, and I'm oh, I uh, Deputy Matt. Chair of Diverse can you, Communities. Can you just wave your, hand, wave your hand so I can see you? Sorry. Well, ah, thank you, sir. Madam. I can't see, sorry. Sorry, this is a long way away. Hello. Hello, yes. Uh, Come hi. on, uh, fire away. Good evening, Mr. Hunt. My name is Asha Massey, and I'm a Deputy Chair of Diverse Communities for the Conservative Party in Coventry. Uh, my question to you is, I, I met you in Coventry at the NH, uh, UCHW Hospital. Yeah, I hope you remember me, and then we met at the Hurston. Can we get on with the question, please? Right, okay. My question is, um, with the ever-increasing rise of the Christians being persecuted, both nationally and internationally, uh, partially Christians losing their jobs for expressing their faith. What course of action will you take in order to deal or bring about change, Mr. Hunt, when you become the president, uh, when you become the MP? <laughs> when I become prime minister. Um, Pro thank you. Sorry. <laughs> thank you, when you Asha. Become the prime minister, thank you, Asha. Thank you. Look, it's a very, very important question um, because. Um, 80% of the people around the world who are persecuted for their faith are Christians. And we sometimes think of Christians as, as white, Western, affluent people, but actually these are some of the poorest people in the world for whom the simple act of going to church is taking a risk with your safety or even your life. And I think we've had a blind spot in British foreign policy, maybe for reasons of political correctness because of the empire or our embarrassment about talking about religion. We haven't done as much as we should. So I commissioned the Bishop of Truro to do an independent report into what more we can do. He published that the week before last. It's an excellent report. And as Prime Minister, I will implement all of his recommendations. Come on, can we get the microphone? My, my name is, is Neil Hudson. No, 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 here. And then we will go to um, the lady there, because I missed you out last time. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a British Bangladeshi councillor from Salisbury. Uh, one of the criticisms I often get is we, our party, don't have a British Bangladeshi MP where other opposition have. If you become the Prime Minister, would you be able to fill the gap and give us a Safe seat rather than a marginal seat. Thank you. <laughs> well, I Good think pitch. we've found our next British Bangladeshi MP. So um, uh, make sure you get on the candidates list, and it would be an honour to have you in Parliament with us. Right. Lady there, followed by the gentleman over there waving the newspaper. Uh, hello, Mr. Hunt. Um, you have said that you support the people of Hong Kong. Um, so, how far are you prepared to go? to show your support for the 2.5 million British nationals overseas in Hong Kong. Will you give them the new uh, blue British passports after Brexit? Thank you. Well, um, thank you for asking that question. And I want you to know that the people of this country stand four square behind the people of Hong Kong. We have a long historic relationship. We are so proud of what Hong Kong has achieved, both during British rule and after British rule. And part of that responsibility has been to say difficult things about the need for China to respect the 1984 Joint Declaration. And, and we are prepared to use our political capital with China to defend what was agreed in that 1984 agreement. Um, I understand your concerns about passports. That is obviously a much bigger issue. But what I want you to know is that we will be there for you and we will defend the agreements that we've made with other countries that affect Hong Kong that are legally binding and everyone needs to remember that. Right, gentlemen over there and then the lady there in the, in the blue jacket. Jeremy, thank you for the opportunity of asking a question. Uh, my name is Matthew Dobbs. Uh, I'm here. I can't. I, He's over there. Yeah, over here. Matthew, hi. Over here. Um, I, I just want to preamble and say as an Ulsterman, I'm extremely comforted that both major candidates have committed themselves to no border down the Irish Sea. Um, but my point really is about taxation. 
uh, two bits of it. One is you mentioned entrepreneurship. A lot of people set up service companies. They were encouraged by their advisors. They had uh, feedback from HMRC that this was perfectly legitimate. They are now being persecuted, some of them to suicide. The first question is whether you will sort out this mess of retrospectiveness, because that is something that no entrepreneur can take as retrospectiveness. Second thing is a lot of people aren't entrepreneurs, they work. And the taxation system, unfortunately, under a conservative government, despite Nigel Lawson's prizes boast that he got rid of a major tax every budget, has got more complex, the tapering of pension relief, the fact that people pay over 100% tax rates effectively at certain levels of income is a national disgrace. And I want to hear your plan to sort that out. Well, Matthew, first of all, um, when it comes to entrepreneurs, uh, we have to do everything we possibly can to bear down on red tape. And I think that uh, taxation matters a lot. And I, I certainly remember when I set up my business that the worst taxes are the taxes you have to pay before you have earned a penny of profit. And that's why I'm particularly worried about high street businesses that are suffering because of the internet revolution and is why I've said I will take 90% of high street businesses out of business rates, which I think will make a big difference. <laughs> but in terms of the overall complexity of the tax system, I actually agree with you. And we should be a party that simplifies the tax system because of all the perverse incentives you get. And I think the most ridiculous thing that's going on at the moment is the number of doctors retiring from the NHS because they maxed out on their pension pots. They retire and then they sell themselves back to the NHS as locums and we end up paying both their pension and their salary and that is completely ridiculous and that is definitely something I want to sort out. What about, what about his point about IR35 and the loan charge? Are you going to sign the loan charge pledge? 200 of your colleagues have done so. Um, I, I will look at it. <clears throat> I will look at it with sympathy. Uh, but I'm not going to give an answer as to what directly I would do because I, I do need to get a proper advice and understand what is actually happening. But I am someone who understands what it's like to be at the wrong end of these kinds of regulations. But the principle of the of HMRC trying to back tax people 20 years ago surely has to be wrong. Well, I, look, I understand that, but we also have to have a fair tax system. So I'm not going to lose the votes of everyone in this room by defending everything that HMRC says. And I said I will look at it with sympathy, um, but I, I need to see the facts before I make a decision. Right, the lady that I pointed, where is she? There. The lady there, and then let's go right up to the back there, and the lady in the, no, the, the lady that's just turned her head round. Yeah, you. Jackie Atkinson, Chairman of the uh, Kids Lit Quiz UK. You said earlier that you want to get all our children reading. Uh, if you become Prime Minister, will you stop closing our public libraries and bring the, make sure that our primary schools all have a, public, a, a library for the children to use? Thank you, Jackie. Great, great question. And um, here's why public libraries matter, because if you look at this rather shocking statistic that nearly a quarter of our primary school leavers are unable to read to the required standard, the, the issue is on the whole with families where sadly parents don't read to their children. And you can spot that very early on, even at the age of four before they've been formally taught to read, you can spot the children who are at risk of that. So we do need, if we're going to solve this problem, to put in strategies very early on when children are young. And access to books, both in their school and outside their school, is a very important part of that. All right. Um, the person who I pointed to isn't standing up over there. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Right. You and then we'll go over there, the gentleman there in about the eighth row with his hand. Yep, you. Um, good, e good evening. Um, 
Good to see you, Jeremy Hunt. You're my neighbouring um, MP. And my question is, children's um, mental health is in crisis, according to Bernardas. And Matt, Matthew Hancock was at a speech a couple of days ago talking about this. Not only that, by 2030, it's going to be the first world disability. Is the NHS prepared for this crisis in the UK? That is such an important question. And, um, you know, the, one of the things that I discovered when I was health secretary is that half of all mental health conditions become established before the age of 14. And the great tragedy is if you don't catch them early, then these conditions, depression, anxiety, can become so entrenched that they, they're stuck with people for life. And we actually have very good mental health treatment in the NHS, but not enough of it. We have probably more provision than any other major European country but we have waiting lists that are far too long. So when I was health secretary, I launched a children and young people's mental health plan. We will become the first country in Europe to have mental health provision in every secondary school. To do that, we need to hire an extra 9,000 people. Uh, that takes time. And so we're only gonna to get to about a quarter of secondary schools by the time of the next election. But the pilots have started. I think it's the right way to go and I want us to be a party that ends the scar of mental health problems that really can be prevented if you catch them young enough. Yeah. It was actually, it was actually you that I meant to ask that question. I think, you, have you got a microphone? Uh, can we get a microphone to the lady there? And then the final question will come from the gentleman over there. Um, Mr. Hunt, you said you have feel democracy in your... Just over there. Sorry, could you give me a wave? Ah, hello. Hi. Um, so you said you feel democracy in your gut. So what I want to know is what do you think of your parliamentary colleagues who have resigned their whip and are now sitting as independents? Do you think they should be forced to have by-elections under a more radical recall programme? Well... <laughs> that, of course, is what... Uh, Douglas Carswell did when he left the Conservative Party and went to UKIP in the last Parliament. Uh, every MP has to make their own choice in this matter. But what I would say is that all of us as MPs need to remember that people are sending us to Parliament not primarily because of our sterling personal qualities, although we may sometimes like to think that. They're sending us to Parliament because we are Conservatives and they are expecting us to behave as Conservatives and unite to deliver the Brexit that was in our manifesto at the last election. Every single one of them fought on that. Right, brief question, brief answer, please. Okay, um, I'll try and summarize as quickly as possible. Um, but spe sorry, hey. Hi. Um, speaking as an ex-young carer, um, um, four, young carers are four times more likely to not be able to go to university. 68% of them are bullied at school. 26% of the, that are because they are young carers. Okay, it's not glamorous, it's not the political issue of the day, but what would you do as Prime Minister to help people in that situation? Well, I, I'll tell you exactly what I would do. I, I want to, first of all, the, the young carers do an incredible job. And if we are going to support you, thank you for what you do. If there is a member of your family, a mum or a dad or a grandparent who has dementia or a mental health condition or a terminal illness or whatever it is, we have to put in place whole family support. Um, and if we do that, that will help you uh, pursue your studies, get to work, do the things that you need to do. It will also reduce costs for the NHS and the social care system if we get it right. And I think it's great that we're having these questions at a conservative hustings, because that shows our compassionate values. <laughs> and as this is my very last answer to the very last question in the whole of this series, I hope you'll forgive me if I do something else, which is say a very big thank you to Ian Dale uh, for the, what he has done. And I actually have a little present for Ian. Oh my God. <laughs> and this is the, the Union Jack that I've been wearing on my lapel badge, because I've got a few more of them. So Ian, thank, thank you, you very you. much indeed. <laughs> Thank 
Well, I'm actually rather sad to be saying for the last time, please thank Jeremy Hunt. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you did me proud. You asked some brilliant questions. And wasn't it interesting that both for Boris and Jeremy, hardly a question. In fact, I'm not sure there were any questions on Brexit, which we're told the Conservative Party is obsessed by. If you want more Conservative leadership chat, join me at 10 o'clock on LBC. I'm getting a limo bike back to Leicester Square right now. Thank you very much indeed.